beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care of the palaces are correct. Episode Alpha Context is key From a possible future To a drop of past To our sisters and brothers of the 21st century, we send to you our greetings of peace and love, from a future position in space-time, which we sincerely hope will also become a part of your future too. As your descendants, we are sending to you this message of hope, as testimony that your possible future timelines include one in which the multiple crises, in which you currently find yourselves enmeshed, can be resolved. The history we teach our children, we divide into three epochs, origination, civilization, and harmonization. Origination is so far the longest epoch, stretching from the origin of Homo sapiens, up to our domestication of plants and animals, with the founding of pastoral and farming communities. Civilization is the troubled epoch in which you find yourselves, when great leaps forward in material wealth and technology came at the cost of gross inequalities, and a merciless exploitation of people and planet. Harmonization marks the blossoming of humankind as cosmic inhabitants, ensuring an ecologically harmonious relationship with our home world's biosphere, as a stable base from which to begin exploring our cosmic locality, sad to say, but we can offer no guarantee that your actual future timeline will include a harmonization epoch. On our way to the stars, we have discovered how to send electronically encoded information backwards along the time dimension by means of which we are sending you this message of hope. To ensure against temporal identity paradoxes, throughout our storytelling, we have employed synthetic voices, and used found imagery from the early 21st century. Our theorists in temporal mechanics have plotted a landscape of probable future timelines from the early 21st century. Within this phase space of all probable future timelines, we find that virtually all your futures map to three landscape zones, extinction, decimation, and harmonization. In the extinction zone, your ecological crisis continually deepens, and worsening catastrophic climate chaos plays the leading role in completing civilization's mass extinction event, encompassing humankind in its obscene obliteration of biodiversity, in short. Man-made global warming drives humanity to join millions of other species in the permanent oblivion of extinction. In the decimation zone, the contradiction of civilization's lust for growth forevermore, at any cost, despite the context of a finite planetary environment, drives rival ruling class factions into committing the atrocity of worldwide nuclear war. The A-bombs and H-bombs create a decades-long nuclear winter, from which only minuscule, isolated, and primitive groupings of humans eventually emerge, having effectively bombed themselves back to the Paleolithic way of life. In the harmonization zone, people the world over rise up in rebellion, bringing the civilization epoch to a revolutionary end, and in the process, humanity begins a progressive new historical epoch, defined by choosing to create a borderless, classless, moneyless, and ecologically harmonious global village, benefiting both people and planet. Only future timelines in this harmonization zone bring together progressive prosperity for humankind, and an end to civilization's mass extinction event. We believe that the story of how we came to occupy our privileged position in space-time, within a timeline in the harmonization zone, is sufficiently astounding that it is our profound duty to share it with you, in the hope that you will collectively ensure that you shepherd your future timeline towards a path parallel to ours. So we are sending to you this revoiced recording of a recent retelling of our redemption tale, from planet killers to cosmic citizens. Our sincere wish is that each 21st century viewer may be sufficiently moved and inspired to choose to make this your redemption tale too, by playing a role in helping create your own worldwide harmonization revolution.
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the story of our great salvation. My name is Moira, and I want to thank you so much for inviting me and my comrade storytellers here to tell you one amazing tale. The narrative of how knowledge from another universe helped humankind save itself from a collective species suicide catastrophe in the man-made mass extinction event, which we've only recently brought to an end. Hey, Moira. Why do we have to be hearing this round a campfire? Hey yourself, Nabanzi. I guess you could say it's all part of our harmonization revolution, and therefore part of our tale. You youngers, in particular, are most likely to be taken by the most modern technology-based storytelling media. Things like full motion holographics, planar movies in 3D and 2D, graphic novels and e-readers, even the printed word, and theatrical productions. But these are the products of so-called civilization, when we were slowly choking our home world's life-bearing capacity to death. Sure, we've assimilated these media into our harmonization enlightenment, but let's consider the big picture, shall we? If we zoom out, and consider humankind's world line as a whole, we can more easily appreciate how relatively brief the troubled epoch of civilization was, in reality. In the 200,000 years our species has walked the Earth, the little time slice known as civilization is less than 5% of that whole time span. So for the great majority of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, as human collective psychology and communication evolved over 200 millennia, our storytelling medium par excellence was to be gathered, as we are today, around a fire. Since we've only recently discovered the pivotal role played in the story of our great salvation by our protagonist Phobina, all around the world, groups of people like you are choosing to hear this story first from fellow members of the storytelling collective like us, seated around open fires, like this. It's a practical example of reverse anthropology made real, learning from today's hunter-gatherer peoples what we lost during our civilization epoch, and thereby choosing to reinstate rituals that appeal directly to our universe of humanity. So now, oh my sisters and brothers, who can tell me a good old traditional way to begin a tale telling? How's about once upon a time? Or maybe, a long long time ago. Yes, that's the one Serena. So, what comes next, anyone? Oh hey, I know what it is. In a land far, far away. That's grand, so thank you. Now then, who remembers how George Lucas adapted the phrase that Bell just gave us? Okay, so I'm enough of a fanboy nerd herder to get this right, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. That's fully right, Tom. But for our story, we have to go one step beyond, and so our tale begins, a long long time ago, in a universe far far away. There once lived a race of beings called the Elders. We only know of them thanks to our comrade Phobina, who carried with her reports of her people's archaeological discoveries on their neighboring moon, were it not for the actions of the Elders. Our two universes would have collided 4.5 billion years ago, destroying everything within both. Even if the calamity had been averted otherwise, then Earth would be moonless, and therefore probably lifeless oh, too. Hang about there, Hen. Can you just hold your horses for a wee moment, please? Sorry to be interrupting, but the last time I looked, the universe, singular, was defined as everything that exists, stars, galaxies, the whole glorious shebang. So if there's this other universe you're on about, and it exists, then all its stuff is, by definition as far as my understanding goes, a part of the universe. 
So you just can he have more than one universe. Do you see what that I mean? That is true. Right, you know. Yep, Fiona, you got a good point there, girl. Well now, this is interactive storytelling, and we can't start off by all falling down a major plot hole, now can we? Truth be told, we kind of anticipated that we would be needing somebody who is a bona fide, well informed physics popularizer to handle just this kind of valid objection. So it's over to you, Tom Fry, the science guy. Thanks, Moira, and many thanks, Fiona, for voicing what some of you are obviously thinking too. Until Fabina felt able to make humankind aware of her presence here on Earth, after her recent fourth awakening, the possible existence of other universes was written off by many scientists as forever unfalsifiable speculation, and therefore in the domain of philosophy rather than physics. But so far Fabina's authenticity checks out as 100% true, as Moira and our actors will be telling you, so how come it's even possible to have more than one universe? Well, for most physicists, the first clues arose during our search for a theory of everything. Quantum field theory has been so successful in describing the fundamental particles that make up matter, and three of their four interactions, that we've had a well-understood standard model of particle physics for a very long time. So we know a heck of a lot about electrons, quarks, photons, neutrinos, and the like, and how they behave, but there are still seemingly intractable unanswered questions about how these fundamental particles acquire all their properties, and how the fourth interaction, gravity, fits in. Okay, so one of our most promising approaches to solving these conundrums lies with a collection of supersymmetrical string theories, collectively known as M-theory, the technical details of which I won't even begin to try to explain. The gist of it is that all those fundamental particles and interactions arise from an underlying simplicity, absolutely infinitesimally small lengths of string-like stuff, vibrating away at a way subatomic scale of distance. Just as the musical notes from a French horn arise from the constraints put on its three-dimensional geometry by a musician, so the properties of our standard model of particles arise from the way minuscule vibrating strings are constrained by the fine scale shape of the fabric of reality. We are all intuitively familiar with four-dimensional space-time, that is the time dimension, plus the three extended spatial dimensions in which we exist, one, left and right, two, up and down, and three, forwards and backwards. But M-theory needs 11 dimensions in which its strings vibrate, and since we cannot detect these apparently missing extra dimensions, they are thought to be compactified, that is, they are all curled up tight with one another, on a distance scale so short we can never observe it directly. Here's where we get stuck, if there were one, and only one, possible way in which to compactify the extra dimensions, then, problem solved, but it turns out there is around 10 raised to the power of 500 ways to do the necessary compactification, arrayed in what's become known as the string theory landscape. That's a very huge number indeed, and there's no obvious way for us to figure out in which of those huge number of ways our universe's extra dimensions are actually compactified. So, finally, Here's where the clue to multiple universes emerges from the M-theory string landscape. If only one of those 10 to the power of 500 multidimensional shapes defines how our universe's extra extra small dimensions are compactified, then what do all the other shapes represent? Some physicists say that the answer is that ours is only one universe in a massively populous multiverse, and therefore all the other possible multidimensional shapes represent how the other universe's extra extra small dimensions are compactified, arrayed in a string landscape of multiple universes. Sure, it may sound very fanciful indeed, to go off on a speculative tangent about the existence of whole other universes, just to explain a geometric quirk in an as yet unproven set of mathematical physics hypotheses, yet according to the information Fabina has brought with her from the elders and scientists of her own species, these aspects of M-theory do indeed appear to be correct. Webisode Alpha, 